Hello and welcome once again to the Generations Bible Study of St. Stephen Church in Louisville, Kentucky. My name is Ken Jobst and we are here in continuation of a study of the Sermon on the Mount. This is actually lesson number 18 in our survey of the, ser the Sermon on the Mount. And today we're going to be taking a look at a passage of Scripture, the first six verses of Matthew chapter 7. So Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, here's the scripture that we're going to be studying today. Jesus says, Judge not that you not be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite! First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. This is the, uh, the, the word of the Lord this day. We give thanks to God for it. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. And I was reading in the, the New King James Version. Now, Matthew chapter 7 opens a, a new final section in the Sermon on the Mount. So we've been studying Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 6 previously. We're coming into this final section of the Sermon on the Mount, and there is one large overriding theme to this particular section, and it's the theme of judgment. So the Sermon on the Mount as a whole describes for us the, uh, the principles, the attitudes of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the heavens. And here we have the, how the principle of judgment uh, impacts the kingdom of God. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting to me that Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 is the most recognized Bible verse among people who are not Christians. Among people who are not Christians, uh, more people can identify, judge not that you not be judged, as a Bible verse. More people can identify that Bible verse than can identify John 3.16, for, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I, I think... I think, first of all, I think that's tremendously sad because the good news is contained in John 3.16. Matthew 7, verse 1, is um, unfortunately, in addition to having the distinction of being the Bible verse most recognized by not Christians, I believe it also has the distinction of being the Bible verse that is most frequently misunderstood and most frequently misapplied. Now, what does this verse mean? What does Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 mean? The, the New King James Version, once again, says, Judge not that you be not judged. Judge not that you be not judged. Well, let's dive down into this verse. Now, what the verse does not mean, first of all, the verse does not mean that we are never to form or express an opinion about someone, right? It, it, it does not mean that. As a Christian, you can still form an opinion about someone or something. That This is not a prohibition against forming opinions, nor is it a prohibition against expressing those opinions. Um, 
A second thing that this verse does not mean, this verse does not mean that we're to be indulgent of every notion that comes along. You know, I, I've, uh, in my time, I've come along some, some pretty way out there ideas. And, you know, as a Christian pastor, my worldview, my touchstone, the way I see things is most typically through a biblical lens. It's like, okay, how, how would I understand this? new technology or this particular situation or whatever the case may be, how, how do I understand that coming up through a biblical worldview? Well, um, there are some folk, once again, those who like to quote, judge not that you not be judged. Some people interpret that as the idea that everybody has to be accepting of every theory, every idea, every... Uh, every new age philosophy or, or whatever that comes along. Well, the verse is not saying that. And remember, when we come upon a verse of the Bible that gives us some trouble or that we really need to understand in a more complete, a fuller way, what we need to do first is let the Bible translate the Bible. Help, you know, allow the Bible to increase our understanding of the Bible. And, and we can do that in a very, very, um, very short order here. We, we can do that very quickly with this particular verse. So take a look at verse 1. Judge not that ye not be judged, right? If that verse is to mean that we are to indulge every idea that comes along, and not to form an opinion, and not to discriminate among varied, uh, you know, varied opportunities, what do we do then with verse 6 in this very same chapter? Because verse 6 is calling us to be able to discriminate. Watch. Verse 6 says, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. So verse 6 is, is basically commanding us to develop the spiritual insight and acumen to be able to distinguish among, uh, you know, for example, that which is holy and that which is not holy. We're called upon to distinguish between those who are, as the, the phrase is being used here, the allegory, you know, those who would be the dogs, who would turn and bite you, and to distinguish, you know, between the, the dogs and those who are not dogs, and to distinguish between the swine and those who are not swine. Now, so if, once again, I'm just, I'm, I feel a need to drive this home. Judge not that you not be judged does not mean don't be discriminating. As a matter of fact, let, let's go on. Let's apply this. We'll, we'll go outside the bounds of this lesson, but we'll still be inside the bounds of this chapter when we take a look at verse 15. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, which, which is the verse about, you know, wolves in sheep's clothing. So if we're not to be discriminatory, if we're not to, to be able to uh, make a, an evaluative judgment about person's ideas or, or whatnot, how will we distinguish wolves in sheep's clothing from sheep? So, so very, very far from the notion of uh, throwing away any ability that we have to discriminate, verse 1 of Matthew chapter 7 must be talking about something else. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, does not mean that we are forbidden to exercise judgment. Because then what would we do? Once again, we're on the principle of letting the Bible interpret the Bible. We, we cast the net, you know, into the next few verses. We can cast the net through the, the rest of the book of 
of Matthew for evidence, we can cast the net through the Gospels. When we cast the net of understanding, you know, trying to help us understand this verse, we look in the immediate context, the broader context of the book, the broader context of the Gospels, then we come upon John chapter 7, verse 24. John chapter 7, verse 24 says this. John chapter 7, verse 24 says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Judge not according to the outward appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Now, how, okay, if we're, if we're going to, uh, how, how do you put those two verses together then? Matthew 7, verse 1, judge not that you not be judged. And John 7, 24, judge with righteous judgment. It sounds like one is saying don't judge and the other is saying here's the way you judge. Well, we, we obviously, we need to drill down deeper into what Jesus is talking about when he's using the, the word judge and judgment. When we do so, we're going to recognize that Jesus is not simply talking about, um, you know, discriminating or making a judgment of one thing is better than another. You know, we all make judgments all the time. We judge, do I like vanilla ice cream or chocolate ice cream or strawberry ice cream? We judge where, you know, which restaurant are we going to go to? We judge which movie we find most entertaining. We judge all the time. So we're, we're making those evaluatory decisions virtually constantly in our lives. So what then does this verse mean? Well, what's going on here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Jesus is prohibiting condemnation, it, pro, prohibiting us, people, pronouncing statements of condemnation. Now, what's, what's, the, what's the difference between condemnation and judgment? Well, I'm glad you asked, because it, it's an important, an important difference. What Jesus is prohibiting here is pronouncing a final judgment on someone. See the difference? It's not just di discriminating which one we like better or which one we think falls into this category or that category. Jesus is talking about the practice of people condemning each other. And when we're talking about condemning, we're talking about pronouncing a final judgment on someone. You know another way to say it? Another way to say it is writing somebody off. Calling, you know, calling someone like, like, okay, you're dead to me. Jesus is prohibiting his disciples from ever writing someone off. Now, here, here's the thing. You, you know what? Okay, now it makes perfect sense to me that Jesus is talking about condemnation rather than discrimination. Jesus is talking about, you know, if you write somebody off, judge not, you know, don't write folk off. Judge not that you not be written off. Don't condemn so you won't be condemned. Watch, and this, this condemnation comes from someplace. The condemnation that Jesus is talking about in prohibiting his disciples from condemning folk that condemnation comes from a, a self-righteous, condemning spirit. It comes from a, a, a spirit that wants to, uh, well, sometimes just wants to get another person out of the way and, and to write them off as, as unimportant so they can be condemned as unimportant. They can be condemned as unworthy of our time. They can be condemned as, you know, you're outside the group of people that, that I'm a part of, and you'll always be outside of that group. 
so on and so forth. Jesus is saying, never write someone off. Never, don't yield to a condemnatory spirit because that, that's, a, that's a very, very um, slippery thing to, you know, once that condemnatory spirit gets in a person, wow, Katie bar the door. I, I, I mean, it, 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 it has a way of taking over. How do we understand what a condemning spirit is all about? Well, and this, this is a, a helpful tool for us. Once again, we're going to let the Bible help interpret the Bible. So that condemning spirit, what, what's the opposite of a condemning spirit? Okay, there, there's a spirit out there that would um, be prone to write people off and to, you know, to, to give an ultimate condemnation of them, which yeah, colloquially, right, we say damn them. So, so to say damn someone means to, you know what, you're off my list, you, you are, in my eyes, you are condemned forever. Wow, that's, that's pretty strong. You know what that's saying? That's saying you don't believe people can change. And that you don't believe, that because you don't believe in that people can change, you don't believe in giving people another chance. In the face of God having given you multiple chances. Well now, right? Okay, so, so there's the spirit of condemnation. And this spirit of condemnation is the opposite of a spirit of love, a spirit of agape love, right? So let's try this exercise. We're going to let the Bible interpret the Bible. When we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, especially these verses, verse 4 through 6, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the love chapter. It's a chapter where the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and telling them all about the way love works. Now, let's try this in this fashion. We're going to let 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 6, be the negative barometer for us of a condemning spirit. Now, now watch. You'll see, you'll see what I'm getting at, right? Here we go. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Now, what does a condemning spirit do? Well... A condemning spirit is not going to suffer long with someone, right? Which means a, a, a condemning spirit is actually going to kind of like snap out at someone. It's not going to suffer long. It's not going to, uh, you know, bear a lot of that burden. It's going to snap. So a condemning spirit does not suffer long. And a condemning spirit is not kind, a condemning spirit is unkind. Condemnation is the opposite of agape love. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Well, when you take a look at a condemning spirit, a condemning spirit does all three of those things. A condemning spirit does envy. And as a matter of fact, it's quite often fueled by envy. A condemning spirit quite often parades itself. It, you, come on, you've heard this phrase. It's the phrase, holier than thou, right? That, that's, that's the notion behind a condemning spirit. And love is not puffed up. Well, that condemning spirit puffs us up, makes us think more of ourselves than we really should be thinking. Verse 5, Paul writing to the church in Corinth about love says, Love does not behave rudely does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. And, and we, we can just kind of give a blanket statement there that, that it, it is not that way with a condemning spirit, right? Um, 
Verse 7, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's what love does. But what does a condemning spirit do? A condemning spirit bears little, believes little, hopes little, and endures little. So we, we can see then why Jesus is instructing his disciples to not have a condemning, judgmental spirit. And then, you know what? Let's look at this. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. What's it say? You, you know this verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Right? So there is there, there is therefore now no condemnation. So that, that notion of being written off, God will not write you off. It, it, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there, there's no writing off, there's no disposing of those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's tremendous comfort. That's a tremendous comfort. Sometimes we sing about God's keeping power. That's what we're talking about. Now, also with this verse of judge not that you not be judged, Jesus is talking about, you know, those with a condemnatory spirit, but Jesus is talking in particular about fault finders, right? And fault finders for the sake of fault finding. Now, uh, fault finders... You know, they, they've got their antenna up. They're looking for somebody who has made a mistake. They've erred. They've, they've gone the wrong way. They've missed the mark, whatever it is. Fault finders, busy as they are finding fault, somehow never find the time to do these three things. They never find the time to understand a person or their, their circumstances. So fault finders never find the time to understand the person that they're criticizing or the circumstances of the person that they are criticizing. Fault finders never... Here's another thing about fault finders. Fault finders never take the time to concede the benefit of the doubt. I love that phrase the benefit of the doubt. You know, um, quite often, we, well, as a rule, right, we don't see all there is to the story. So there is, by necessity, a, a, a measure of doubt in whatever the, the circumstance, in, in whoever that we're, you know, charging out to judge or condemn, there's part of the story we don't know. And we don't know the story because we, you know, th there may be a part of the story that is crucial that for some reason or another we're not aware of. That creates what's called a doubt. You know, it could be like this or it could be like that. Uh, the more charitable interpretation then is called the benefit of the doubt. Fault finders never concede the benefit of the doubt to someone. They grab the doubt and run with it in a condemnatory direction. And then, you know what? Fault finders never take the time to exercise mercy. How crucial is mercy in our world? You know what? Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. And if we were going to take the time to, to pounce on every mistake that everybody ever made, whew, we'd never get anything else done, right? Now, so that's, that's the, the, the notion behind this opening verse in chapter 7, judge not that ye not be judged. And as I've said, the entire chapter, the entirety of chapter 7 is focused around this theme of judgment. It's a big theme. 
And it's a big idea in the Bible. As a matter of fact, judgment has at least, you know, a minimum of three different distinct uh, understandings in the Bible. So, so when we when we talk about judgment in the Scripture, we need to be aware that there are different types of judgment that are are talked about in the Bible. And let it it's probably going to be helpful for us to take just a moment right here and really dive into um, the different understandings of judgment that are expressed in the Bible. The first type of judgment, you're, you're probably aware of and, and understand fairly well, the, the first type of judgment that we want to consider is that, that final and eternal judgment when we, we stand before God, right? That, that, that final judgment. Judgment. By the way, whenever I talk about judgment, and as we'll see in chapter 7 of Matthew, sometimes, ju- some, sometimes we interpret the word judgment in a variety of different ways. Sometimes it's unclear to us how to interpret the word judgment. I'd, I'd like for us to keep an image in our minds, though. When we talk about judgment... Keep the image in our minds of a yardstick or a tape measure or a ruler, right? Because judgment means you are being compared to a standard. So judgment revolves around being compared to a particular standard. For the Christian, right? Actually, for all of us, for all of creation. The standard is Jesus Christ. And and so we are to compare ourselves not by the standard of one another, not by the standard of the world, not by a standard that we dream up because it fits us, like, you know, uh, like the guy that goes out with his, uh, goes out with his rifle and he shoots the barn four or five times, shoots the barn, and then goes over to the barn and paints bullseyes around the bullet hole. Well, that's not the way it works, right? So when, when, we're, when we're talking about judgment, we're talking about being compared to a standard. And the standard to whom we are being compared is always and eternally the standard of Jesus Christ. So that first understanding of judgment is that final and eternal judgment when we stand before God right? Judgment day, right? You got it. Okay. There's a second type of judgment that is, uh, let's call it the self-judgment of a Christian. The self-judgment. And and watch, this is is pretty interesting. Um, Let's say that that somebody comes up and tells me that, um, you know, to to be able to qualify for this particular race that's coming up, I need to be able to run an eight-minute mile. I need to be able to cover on foot, right, running. I need to cover a mile in eight minutes. Well, okay. Wouldn't it make a whole lot of sense for me while I'm training to have a stopwatch while I'm training to see how close I am to that eight-minute mile, or let's make it a 10-minute mile. You know, let, um, am, I, am I meeting the standard, or am I going to wait until I, you know, I, I come up to the, the race itself and find out, oops, I'm, I'm too slow for this race. So there is the second style of judgment. The second style of judgment is the self-judgment of a Christian. Now, you know in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, has to do with our our conduct with the Lord's Supper. And and here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. Right? So, So as Christians, we ought to examine ourselves before we partake in communion. Now, Understand, 
I'm not saying that somebody else examines you. It's not up to somebody else. It's a self-assessment, a self-judgment. So if we judge ourselves and we find that we're not where we need to be, we've got the opportunity to make the correction to, to bring ourselves up to the, the proper measure. So we, we've got three different kinds of judgment. We've got the final and eternal judgment of God, where God is, God is the judge, right? God is the judge. Christ is the standard. We've got the self-judgment of a Christian, where we serve as our own judge, and, and once again, Christ is the standard. Christ is the ruler. Christ is the yardstick. And then there, there's actually another type of reward uh, or judgment that's mentioned in the Bible, and that's the judgment of rewards, which is, is very interesting to me. We don't talk about the judgment of rewards enough, in my opinion. Uh, th there I go, giving an opinion, right? Now, what's the judgment of rewards? Well, the judgment of rewards takes place in heaven. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, here's what the Apostle Paul writes. Listen to this. This, this is great stuff. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Now, what we're, what we're talking about here is you've got the foundation of Jesus Christ. What are you building with? What are the materials you are using to build upon that foundation? And then if, if you're building with gold, silver, and precious stones, well, there's a reward for that. But if you're building with wood, hay, and straw, well, you know, the, the day is going to reveal that, that the, the you know, things are cleansed by fire, and the fire is going to consume the dross. It's going to consume the, the wood, the hay, and the stubble, but it's going to simply purify the gold, the precious stones, the silver. So three types of judgment. God's eternal final judgment, right? The, the Christian's self-assessment judgment, and then a judgment of rewards uh, that is predicated on what we did with what God gave us, right? Okay, now, woo wee we, we've made it through verse 1 of chapter 7. My goodness, now, now watch. I, I, we're going to pick up the pace here quite a bit. Judge not that you not be judged. For, verse 2 begins with the word for, right? Which tells us because, judge not that you not be judged because, you know, for, with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. Now, what does that mean? Um, we, verse 2 says, we're going to be judged or measured by the standard that we apply to others. And you know what? That makes all the sense in the world. Because... The act of judging, right, in, in this, you know, the, the act of judging or condemnation, as we've talked about, for us to step into that role means that we are accepting the title of authority person. We're, but because we take it upon ourselves to be the authority in judgment, the authority in condemnation, well, then, if we sit as the authority over others, we shouldn't complain if that same standard gets applied to us. See, it's just a poetic kind of an irony going on there, that as soon as we set ourselves up as the expert, then we should be judged as an expert, right? Watch, watch. If Albert Einstein says he's an expert in physics, 
right? Then he should have no problem if we give him a physics exam, right? If, if, uh, if, if someone presents themselves as an expert in, uh, you know, an expert in medicine or whatever, then they should, they should be able to handle a, a, a little medical exam fairly straightforwardly. Now, um, so when we sit in authority in condemnatory judgment against somebody else, we shouldn't complain. Because if we set ourselves up as the authority, we shouldn't complain when the authority comes around for us, right? I'm just saying. Now, um, you know the truth of it. The, the truth of it is, ultimately, we cannot judge because we're incapable of this kind of judgment. We're incapable of true condemnatory judgment. And we're, we're incapable of it along several different dimensions, but two of which really grab my attention. First of all, we're incapable of it because we have limited knowledge. We don't know everything. The, the judge, right, the, the judge needs to know the rule book. The judge needs to know the performance of the person. The judge needs to be able to see from all the different angles, so on and so forth, right? Well, we have very limited knowledge because we are finite, limited beings. And then, you know, even above and beyond our limited knowledge prohibiting us from being adequate judges, um, we have mixed motives in judging. Why is it that we want to be judging anyway? Or, or as, uh, as one of my friends in, in school would say, who died and made you judge of the whole world? So, right? Um, now, you know what? Then, then let's, let's hasten right along here uh, where Jesus gives the il illustration to us in verse 3. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and you don't consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? Look, a plank is on your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck in your brother's eye. I mentioned in a message not long ago about uh, how delicate the eye is. The eye is so remarkably delicate that just a, a puff of air will, will cause the eye to close. And, you know, the, the, the eye needs that protection. Uh, imagine that you've got the irritation. Maybe you do have the irritation of a, 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 a some little speck in your eye, and then here comes somebody ready to pull it out, uh, except they've got a big log in their eye. Now, obviously, they're going to bumble around and, like, poke you in your eye while they're trying to get that little speck out because they've got this big log that, that's obscuring their vision. So somebody with no vision is basically trying to improve your vision? How's that going to work out? And, and this, I, I count this as uh, some of Jesus' finest comedy. Because if you, if you think about it, yeah, this, this is a pretty ridiculous idea. And, and once again, Jesus is speaking in hyperbole. You know, he, he's painting a... a an amazing word picture here of somebody with a little speck in their eye and then a guy with a, 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 a big two by four poking out of his eye comes along to offer to help this other person. Now, you know, you see what's going on here, right? A lot of times, well, let me, let me put it this way. Jesus is speaking spiritually to us, right? He's not literally talking about uh, wood specks and wood logs. He's talking about pointing out in someone else a problem that is actually magnified in the person who's pointing it out, right? It, it's, uh, you know, someone has a spiritual log in their eye. What is that spiritual log? That spiritual log is the condemnatory spirit. That spiritual log is the fault 
finding spirit. That's what the log is. And so Jesus is saying, hypocrite, first get the log out of your own eye. And so what Jesus is saying is, first, get rid of your condemnatory, judgmental spirit. You know, uh, the, the most delicate organ that we have is the eye, as I mentioned, right? That, that it, it can't stand a, a lot of different things. A puff of air will, will cause the eyelid to close. And then for somebody, some goofy person to come along and say, let me straighten out your eye, and they're not aware that they're half blind themselves. Now, your soul is the same way. Your, your soul is a very, very delicate uh, instrument. And to have somebody come along who thinks they're doing you a favor, but is actually poking their thumb in your eye, eh, you don't need that. You, you don't need that. Um, Hypocrite, verse 5 says, first remove the plank from your own eye, right? So how do we remove that plank from our own eye? Well, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways. And, I, I, you know, uh, implicit bias training might be one of the ways in which people can help get the log out of their own eye. There's some things that we don't see that we need to have our attention called to. So first remove the plank from your own eye spiritually remove that plank. And, and that comes with a lot of prayer. That comes with humility. That comes with a rededication to, you know, really understanding what the gospel is all about. Then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And I, I, have, I have great respect for the 12-step programs in which someone who has been through the same thing is going to serve as a resource to someone. And typically in the 12-step the programs, yeah, the, the, the person that is, is helping you get a speck out of their eye, they've gone through the work and the effort to get the log out of their eye. So a tremendous respect for those programs. Verse 6, verse 6. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before the swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, very quickly, this verse teaches us some very important things. First of all, number one, there are different kinds of people out there, and we have to learn to be able to discriminate among them. You know, God is not a cookie-cutter God. There are some people that have kind of a short fuse. There are some people that have a longer fuse. You know, there, there are some people that see things one way, some people see them another. There are different kinds of people. We need to understand that. Secondly, we need to learn what to give each type of person that we encounter. So, you know, don't give what is holy to the dogs. Don't cast pearls before swine. And in, in saying that, it uh, actually there's a very, very deep principle that, that's behind this, you know, that there, there are some folk that have to learn what is valuable. All of us need to learn what is valuable before we will value something. So Jesus is just saying, you know, uh, we need to learn what to give to each person that we encounter. We can't just give the gospel in the same way to everybody. Now, okay, yesterday I was on the way back from Hardin County, and at an intersection in Radcliffe, there's a guy with a bullhorn, and he's preaching to the people at the stoplights, right? Now, I've got nothing against that, but, but what I'm saying is sometimes you need different types of bait to catch different types of fish. Will the guy with the bullhorn catch many fish? I'd say probably not many. He might catch a couple fish. But if the guy with the bullhorn uh, preaching the gospel spreads out, you know, a variety of different techniques, and as Pastor says, you know, uh, offers a lot of different types of bait, then he'll probably be able to reach a greater number of people. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. That there are some that are at the milk stage. There are some that are at the meat stage. 
So you wouldn't give a baby a T-bone steak, right? A baby needs the milk. But you wouldn't want to give a mature person milk over and over and over and over and over and over and over. So we need to have the discernment and the wisdom to give milk to those who need milk and meat to those who need meat. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't give what is holy to the dogs. And it reminds us all, ultimately it reminds us of what an awesome responsibility it is to be a custodian of the grace of God and to be a custodian of the word of God. So we, you know, we have a tremendous privilege in being able to be ministers, each and every one of us, of God's word and God's grace. Well, that's the first few verses of Matthew chapter 7. That's going to uh, keep us going. Next week, we're going to continue. We'll, we'll pick up at Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and following, and I hope that you will be a part of that study as well. Let's have a word of prayer together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've spent together. We pray that uh, in the, the process of your grace and your mercy and your love, that you would help us to remove some logs that we have in our eyes, that we might be more effective uh, and, and more compassionate and more gracious um, servants of, of your heavenly kingdom. We thank you for our church and our pastor and pray your continued blessing to be with the Generations Bible Study Group. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, from Louisville, Kentucky and the St. Stephen Church, this is Ken Jobst with the Generations Bible Study. Look forward to seeing you again really soon. Take care. Bye-bye.